Okay, I'll talk about um, Total's Gaia program, program which is a, um, a collaboration between uh, Total and, uh, and Google. Um, Gaia stands for the Geoscience Artificial Intelligence Applications, and it's a digital program to accelerate the, uh, the geoscience interpretation part of the EO ENP workflow. It's an internal initiative that was undertaken um, beginning uh, early 2018 in, in partnership with uh, Google. We decided to focus uh, for the first, um, for the first um, um, workflows at, at, the, uh, at the geoscience interpretation um, aspects. We figured that's where uh, machine learning uh, prog program, um, problems could, would be, um, uh, algorithms would be most adapted to the, um, to the problems at hand. And then the mission statement is to um, to give uh, give time back to the uh, to the geoscientists. The really the objective is to uh, enhance uh, enhance productivity of, of the of the geoscience um, um, stage. So Total doesn't have a lot of machine learning uh, experience um, internally, so we um, we needed to partner with someone, and we wanted to partner with someone that had. Two main uh, two main features. One was very be very strong in, in machine learning um, uh, research and um, applications, and then we also wanted to move quite quickly and get some some form of uh, production uh, tools out fairly quickly to uh, our um, our interpreters. So in this case, there is not that many uh, companies that could offer that. Uh, Google was one of them, and the advantage for Google really was that. They were offering a, a collaborative way to work um, with us as opposed to just uh, being a service provider. So we've established a team at, uh, with Google. Um, we've located uh, about a dozen geoscientists and data scientists from Total located at the uh, Google campus in uh, California. Um, and um, we focused on two main, uh, two main work streams. So the first work stream is, is um, in terms of um, getting information out of documents. So we've called it semantic AI. Um, one typical problem, uh, formulation of the problem would be if, if, if you can bring in a large amount of documents and very quickly extract very key information, uh, necessary information from them in a short time frame. So we could imagine something like a, a data room with hundreds of documents and, and maybe just uh, a few days to, uh, to look at them. So tools that have been, uh, are under development on this, uh, on this work stream are um, first to actually classify the documents as to what kind of document they are, focusing on geoscience documents, so well reports, seismic reports, contracts, so on, to extract figures from the documents, to um, classify the figures as to what kind of figure they are and to, to extract uh, also information from the figures and um, text from the figures and from the figure captions that would give information about what um, area it's from or what formation it's in, for example. And then what's becoming a more long-term thing is to extract textual information, contextual information from the uh, raw text of uh, documents. So that's one work stream, and then the other work stream is in um, seismic interpretation. So after um, about a year of, uh, of this uh, collaboration, we're, um, we're happy to say that we're starting to see some fairly good uh, results in the interpretation. This is an uninterpreted line, and a line interpreted using the, the machine lear learning algorithm that's been uh, developed. It's what we call it, it's the, 2D, uh, the 2D algorithm. And we see uh, quite a good interpretation on, uh, on this kind of line. This is based on the fact that uh, the seismic is obviously very quite high quality seismic data. The training data that we're using is applicable to this data, so it's a very nearby um, data set, a different data set, but nearby in the same geology, and it has a very clean interpretation in it. Um, so those are all requirements to get a good interpretation out of, out of this algorithm. The applicability is limited to basically good seismic data. I don't have an example to show in, in poor seismic data, but uh, the results are, are, are pretty random for now. So 
So we are looking at, uh, at, at really an advantage and a substantial time savings in uh, good seismic data. But we can s there is a huge time savings in this kind of thing. When, when there is a large set with, as we can see the image on the right, there's, there's a lot of faults. This can be um, both interpreting the faults, the, the, the fault attribute, the, um, the sticks, and individualizing the faults can be done in a few hours. Looking a bit at the, um, at the uh, workflow, um, first on the, on the left, that's a, that's a manual interpretation done on, on uh, this data. The next figure shows the uh, fault attribute, and so this is done on 2D images. So it's a 3D seismic uh, cube, which is broken into uh, approximately 20, every 20th uh, inline and crossline, and uh, also slices. The fault attribute is done on these uh, on these 2D images, so the uh, the, the sections and the and the time slices. Faults uh, fault sticks are automatically extracted, and then to individualize the faults into into individual objects that could be used to, for example, populate um, a reservoir model. That's done with a, with a little bit of um, interaction. So there's they both have to be seeded. Um, and then the faults are individualized quite nicely and, 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 and a nice fault is made if it's not really touching other faults. But if it's branching, that's where it's a little trickier. And we see the purple fault on the, uh, on the far right side. In attempting to uh, create the object, there's a couple small antithetic faults that are, are um, near the top of it. You see sort of the darker, uh, darker lines across. Those aren't separated out, so that has to be cleaned up by... Um, by manual, uh, manual, manual cleaning. The example on the bottom is another, is another um, this is a different uh, data set, and this is an example of, um, of, of uh, another test data set where the accuracy or the precision of, of, the, uh, of the algorithm is, uh, is, is being tested. And again, this is pretty nice quality seismic data. And what's used as the training data for this example is a nearby seismic survey that had been interpreted in the past but has a clean, a nice clean uh, interpretation. And so what we see in green was, is, a, is a human interpretation where someone is asked to interpret everything they could find for faults on, on this seismic. And in red, we see the, uh, the uh, machine learning algorithm. And overall, the, um, the precision is quite good. They're overlaying each other. Um, quite satisfactorily. There's a couple small cases where, where, the, um, where the algorithm is not finding, the, uh, not finding faults the human interpreted. It's adding um, a, couple, um, a couple things. And so in that section of the seismic, it's, uh, it's fairly good uh, quality. What's interesting is the upper section. There's a lot of little faults in the shallow section, and nothing of that was found. And the reason is that the training data set wasn't interpreted for this reason. It was interpreted in the past for, for regular, um, regular production work. And that's not an area of interest particularly, and that wasn't interpreted in the training data set. So as an example of represented representativity that uh, it's not in the training set, data set, it doesn't know to look for it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the blind data set. So one thing that was, because we're working on a fairly short time frame, is to, um, to get some acceptance for this kind of, uh, of, this kind of uh, tool, is to show that it actually is giving a quantifiable um, increase in productivity. So that's done two ways. One is, as in the past example, actually seeing how long it takes someone to interpret uh, a, line, uh, a line or a data like that compared to how long it takes the algorithm. And then the other is, has been done by conducting some surveys of interpreter community in, uh, in total as to both how long it takes them to do certain kinds of tasks and also um, to get a feeling of the quality of seismic data they have in the in the production data that they use, in, in, the, in the regular seismic data that they have to interpret. Um, so we see in good quality data, um, 
there's, there's actually a substantial time for savings in the automatic stick extraction. And then even with the manual uh, input, in terms of individualizing the faults into single objects, there's, there's potentially huge time savings. So up to 70 or 80% in, uh, in good quality data. In the overall world, that has to be offset by the fact that in poor quality data or even much medium quality data, there's, there's no benefit. The, this, uh, this tool gives a pretty random uh, result. And why is that? Because it's working on pattern recognition. And in poor quality data, then faults are interpreted partly on that, but partly on interpreter experience and partly on geological concept of what kind of faults would, would be expected and, and, and so on. And that's, that's, not what this is, uh, that's not what this tool is, uh, is giving. So I should say with, with that and given the overall um, um, amount of good quality data in, in the... Um, in the seismic inventory, then, then we, we can imagine about a 20 to 30 percent productivity gain in terms of seismic interpretation in, uh, for faults. Um, another, another tool that um, is, um, or another algorithm that's being developed is, is to do this more in proper 3D. So the map on the left is a time slice using that, uh, the 2D algorithm that I described. And it gives a nice result for the faults, but there's a fair amount of artifacts. In this case, they're mainly following the um, acquisition direction of the, of the seismic. The map on the right is the 3D uh, fault interpretation um, algorithm. And the initial results, I guess, are, are quite promising, but uh, it's been slower to develop. And it's been slower to develop because we're building on Google's machine learning tools, and their experience in pattern recognition is really on, on 2D images, on photos, on um, medical scans, and things like that. So it's been a real problem to figure out how to break a 3D down into small cubes that are manageable, to segment it down into those, to, to run an algorithm on it, and then to build that back up into the, uh, into the result. So. It's, uh, it's, it's been a bit slow to develop, and, and then the other issue with this is it's pretty heavy on computer time, although perhaps not as much as we were, uh, we were fearing. So in terms of, um, in terms of uh, directions of improvement, and this is a further example, actually. These are the same two maps I showed, and, and then on the upper images are the uh, 2D and the 3D algorithms on, on a section from uh, that seismic survey. So uh, the first uh, main axis of improvement is to continuing to work on the 3D uh, model because it's showing quite a bit of uh, promise. Um, and it's still ongoing work in terms of the fault propagations, um, extracting the 3D faults from the 2D, and in particular, individualizing the fault into individual objects that can be uh, used for, uh, for example, reservoir models. Um, and then the third axis is to improve the training data sets. And by that, I mean both the feedback loop of how the interpreter um, modifications from the interpreter are put back into the training data set, and also techniques to improve the representativity of the training data set with um, uh, running it through filters or running different algorithms on it to um, like AGC or things like that to broaden the char seismic characteristics of the training data set so it can be representative for a larger possibility or a larger range of, of, um, of interpretation sets. So where we are in this is that the 2D, um, the 2D fault model is in pilot in, uh, in total. The 3D model um, should be hopefully in pilot uh, next year. And, um, and so, um, so we'll see how that, uh, how that goes is at least one uh, one affiliate using the 2D uh, model now. There's also been some work done on horizon interpretation. This is a little different problem because unlike faults, it's, it's hard to say exactly what is a horizon in this sense. Um, and the uh, the workflow that uh, is, is being uh, developed is more of a assisted learning workflow. So here the interpreter Begins, an, begins on a survey, and as he interprets, 
he or she interprets. The, uh, the training data set is built up on that interpretation. And after a certain amount of, uh, of, of, of uh, time spent interpreting, then uh, the training data set becomes advanced enough it can propose interpretations. So as you jump 5, 10, 20 lines, you'll get a, a proposal interpretation from the, uh, from the data set, and uh, you can accept it or, or uh, reject it, interpret on, and continue feeding the, uh, the training data set. This example here is from a 3D where half the 3D was interpreted for a training data set. This is from the other half of the 3D, and, and so this is the, um, the machine learning uh, proposal and, uh, or, or suggestion. And um, we see actually a fairly good result that um, the fault offsets are generally uh, honored, but it's, it's not necessarily very sharp in all the, um, all the areas. So this is, it's, uh, it's a bit of, uh, bit of progress needed to sharpen up and clean up the uh, result. Um, so just to uh, say a couple things in conclusion, um, this is what we get from Google, basically, is that uh, people starting machine learning projects with them, they expect that the, uh, the time is going to be spent on the machine learning algorithms. And the reality is that's almost the least significant part of, uh, time, um, of, uh, of, of the time effort. What was really underestimated is, is to collect the, the data, because for these kind of things to work, we need really good training data sets. They have to be clean um, and, um, and they have to be representative. And uh, so that's a lot of data. Um, building, the algorithm, building the infrastructure is a lot. And then also it's been a fair amount of effort to integrate this into our uh, internal um, interpretation package. So getting back to the, uh, the ambition, we have um, we have a lot of time spent by uh, geoscientists uh, going through data and doing some fairly simple seismic interpretation. And where can we um, where can we improve this? If we, if we give time back to the geoscientists, then we give them more uh, more time to be uh, to be creative, to come up with new ideas, to collaborate, and to do the uh, and to do the uh, reporting. So that's the promise of, of uh, these kind of tools. Um, I'll just say a couple things that uh, challenges or implications of this. Um, there's a couple legal issues we have to be uh, mindful of because we are using cloud services. So we, um, we have to make sure that uh, data export restrictions uh, from some countries don't allow data export, that that has to be honored um, because right now it's, it's uh, partly using US servers. So Political sanctions have to be uh, have to be um, have to be honored. The data is anonymized right now for all the all the uh, upload uh, to cloud. And then, from a time point of view, to continue with this kind of uh, project, there's a huge investment of time of of the uh, of the staff in in a company like Total to gather data, clean data, and also. The, uh, the, the effort required to maintain and, and develop these models. And then, of course, as, as said before, this is going to change the way we work. These are new tools. People are going to have to learn how to use them. And I'd say there's a greater, greater demand for data scientists in, in companies like, uh, like ours.